I'm Matt. I'm Kerry. We are the Stagmer Brothers of Baltimore Knife and Sword. We're going to be building some of your favorite weapons, and some weapons that you've never seen before. This is Man at Arms, Reforged. Ever since we began the show, you guys have been begging for a Ruby build. There's a lot of really complex weapons, and most of them are really cool, and they're kind of hybrid weapons that change and do multiple things. The one we chose to start with is Vice Knee's Rapier. This is a sword slash revolver that shoots elemental dust that does all kinds of different stuff, and luckily I'm not in charge of figuring that out. What I'm gonna start with is drawing the flanges that have to be engraved. Kerry wants to do it first on the CNC engraver to just trace in those lines, and then Bob's gonna go in and cut them much deeper by hand. Ilya's gonna forge the blade. It's gonna have a lot of different elements to it, but for now, let's get to drawing. All right, got the engraving. Looks awesome. So this will be the line drawing that Carrie's gonna work from to do the engraving. Now let's go ahead and just draw the flanges real quick. What we're gonna do, since we're forging this piece from a one inch piece of square 1080 steel, I'm gonna be using the lathe with a center drill to set a hole in the back side of the bar that's gonna be forged into the blade on this rapier. The bolt will go down inside of the cylinder of the sword and we'll pull this blade into place. The reason for that is that we don't have a long tang because we've got a cylinder there that's gotta be able to rotate and it has to be able to break open. So I'm just gonna go ahead and run this on the lathe, drill that center, drill down into it to take the material out. And then after Ilya's finished forging, I'll do the tapping. If I do it ahead of time, it's possible that the threads could be warped from the forging. To forge our rapier blade, Billy is going to start from some round stock. He's first going to square it up, draw out his taper, and then start beveling. Even though this blade may seem to be quite simple to forge, it's kind of tricky. He's got to start from a square cross section up by the guard and taper it out to a diamond. So he's going to do some of this on the power hammer, then move to the anvil and lay in some of those bevels by hand. I'll have to then true everything up on the grinder. using the plasma table to cut the side plates for the sword. They actually are structural in this piece. They're gonna hold the entire assembly. I'll have to cut and put a pivot into one. And then the locking mechanism for the entire thing will come in through the backside of the pommel to hold everything in place. I'm gonna start by cutting four of these sections. Then once we get them finished, we'll clean them up, we'll engrave them, and we'll start assembling the entire sword. Okay, for our ruby sword build, you can see that Carrie's gone and cut these side plates out on the plasma cutter, and they still have a little bit of a rough finish on the outside surface, so I'm gonna go ahead on our 180 grip belt here, I'm gonna go ahead and start to smooth them out a little bit in order to get them ready for the next stage of finishing. While Kerry's figuring out the rest of the machining done on this build, 
I forged out the blade. Now, I had to take great care of not squashing the hole which will attach itself to the rest of the mechanism. So I left it at one inch square. This transition is a little bit awkward. When the angles are so steep, beveling a blade, you don't have enough force to move the material in on itself, and you're just pushing your billet to the side, skating on the handle. This gives Matt more material to show his skill in making a nice transition between a square and a standard diamond. With the blade now forged, I've been able to start grinding. All I've done at this point is trued up the perimeter. From here, my next major goal is to go ahead and smooth out the transition from our square gun barrel shape into our blade shape. You can see right here, I got some material I gotta remove. Ilya's already established the nice diamond cross section and the bevels by hand hammering. So it's really gonna make my job easier. I'm just gonna follow the lines that he's already put into this blade, true everything up, then we'll be able to move on to heat treating. But before we do that, we're gonna have to make sure it carry threads this hole that he drilled earlier, because if we tried to do that after heat treat, we're just gonna break the tab right off because this material will be too hard. I'm gonna be tapping this hole. It's 5 8 11, I've got a brand new cutter. Got some tapping oil, Tap Magic does a really good job. And the 1080 that this was made out of, Ilya's heat cycled down to make sure it's as soft as possible for me. And I've run a correct size reamer down through it, so I know I've got the proper clearance. I put a little extra oil at the top of the piece. And what happens is, as the cutter goes down, it'll pick up a little bit of that oil and take it down into the hole with it as it goes. It's gonna give me a pretty big grade eight bolt that's gonna be pulling this blade up into the barrel section. Now that the blade has been ground most of the way to shape, Kerry has the threaded section added. It's time to heat treat. He has to start by getting the thicker part heated up first. Once that's the temperature, he'll flip it around, get the rest of the blade to heat, and then move to the oil for the quench. All right, at this point, our blade has been rough ground. It's also been heat treated and tempered. You can see it stayed pretty nice and true, but I got a little bit of edge wandering, and that's from my grind. Normally, you just see me uh, eyeball my edge straightness, but I wanna show you guys a little technique you can use to make sure your edge doesn't warble, and that's just by clamping it in a vise, using a file, and skating along the edge. Now, obviously, the blade is hard, so it's not gonna really bite in a lot, but it'll just grab those little peaks It'll do a good job, make everything nice and flat, and then I'll move on to doing the rest of the grinding and polish this thing out. The engraving on the side plates is going to be something we're going to either do by hand or maybe we'll do a deeper cut with this machine later on. But initially, so we can see what we're doing and leave it as a permanent mark on the surface, I'm going to use a diamond scribe. I've taken a small diamond tip out of one of my regular engraving machines. It's spring-loaded. It's going to go down, scribe across the surface of this piece, and the diamond will leave a deep gouge, leaving our entire pattern on the surface of the piece. go to the grinder and blend the transitions from where the material was already square into the section where Ilya has forged the blade. Now I know you guys are used to seeing Ilya do most of the engraving by hand, which is excellent. We all love that work. But there are a lot of different flanges. Each one has to be engraved on two different sides. So we're gonna do this using a pneumatic hand engraver. Bob studied and learned how to do this. It's gonna be a little quicker than doing it by hand. 
showing a whole new process you guys haven't seen. It should be pretty awesome. The part that I'm going to be making on the lathe is fairly simple, but it's pretty crucial in this case. We'll be cutting a step here. This will be turned into the frame. We're also going to have to bore a hole through the center. It's actually where the blade is going to sit tight up against it. On the opposite side, this cylinder finished out is going to sit up tight against it. The barrel is going to lock to it and all of the outside pieces that get engraved that hold the whole sword together. Everything comes back to this small round piece. through several grits on a couple different sanders. Matt brings the finish up on the blade. Later, we'll scotch bright and polish it. I'm going to be making this handle out of a solid piece of steel. I'm using solid only because I've got a 5 8 hole down the center and I want to be able to have that draw bar have a lot of support where I'm working. It's about six inches overall. I'm going to cut it right here on the lathe. So it's going to go three quarters of an inch, one inch, 1.4. It's an organic form so we're going to sweep in and make that cut. If I was using the taper attachment it would give me an absolutely straight taper and that wouldn't be very pleasing to the eye. Carrie's got done turning our handle for our rapier for Ruby. I'm gonna go ahead now, clean up all the lathe marks on it. Once I get this done, I'm gonna hand it off to Matt so he can add that spiral to the grip. One of the most important parts of this rapier build is the revolving cylinder. We have to mill this out just like you would see in a revolver with six equal holes spaced correctly. Carrie's going to use an indexing machine and move to the CNC to create those holes. This will house our elemental powder that will later shoot out our barrel.
use this small knife edge wheel for doing detail work. In this case, Matt's going to lay in the spirals that go all the way up this tapered handle. going to be doing now is I've got to drill and hide the spring down inside. It's going to be in line with the firing mechanism that's actually in the back side here. I put a small drill bit in that hole so that I've got the angle. I'm matching that primarily so that when the spring comes out the other side it's as high on the hammer as possible giving us the most power. I'm going to go ahead and cut that in so it cuts in on the angle and then I'll come back in with a drill once I know it'll go straight from there and go right on in. No dust rapier is complete without all the dust colors in the chambers of the cylinder. So we've already begun to paint some of them in. We're going to take a special lithochrome paint and we're going to fill these areas and finish these off so the Merton Nester has all the dust it needs. We'll start applying the paint in the center of the area and push it out to the sides as opposed to running the brushes down the sides first. This way we can fill it up and get a nice, even, consistent level, as opposed to trying to get in those edges first and have it go over top and have to have extra cleanup. So now we have our hammer functional, we have our spring in place, the entire piece is put together. The cylinder which sets in here has been painted and engraved. When it closes up, it'll lock that in place. This is a retaining bar that's holding our spring. What we've done to set the power to make sure that we can strike it hard enough is we've shortened this spring over and over again, reached down and pulled it through. It retains the hammer. The hammer is on a pivot that's part of the handle. You can see that's the pivot that holds the hammer. That'll come down, strike our cap, which has the small charge in it, set off the charge in this chamber. The powder, which is inside of the cylinder that rotates for the different colors, is then forced out the end, and that should blow a big buff out right out the front. Draw bar goes down the center, all the way through. That's what locks the blade in. Everything should function the way we need it to. So we've done most of the engraving on the cylinder. We've done the painting. Sometimes we have to play hot potato in the builds, pass things back and forth. We still have one more engraving to do, so we're going to finish that up now. I knew when we started this build, there were gonna be a lot of intricate parts. Swords from anime and other types of drawings often have parts that just simply don't fit when you create them in the physical world. And it's really great how the entire shop steps up to make these things happen. Click here to subscribe or click here to watch more episodes.
Thanks for watching Man at Arms Reforged. We need to know what you want the guys to build, so tell us in the comments below what weapons you want to see next.